Hey everyone, um, this is Okwe, and in Beyond the Build, we talk about all of the other stuff that goes on beyond just writing the code. So we might talk a bit about writing code, but like being a software engineer is a lot more than just building software. It's about all the other things. So yeah, we try to go over all those things um, in this podcast. Yeah. Today we're talking about using AI in your work and just using AI to write code or AI writing code that you're supposed to write or <laughs> or however way you use AI and just our experiences with it and our thoughts on how certain things go. So yeah, um, to start, I want to pose a question to you. Do you use AI in your work? Hell yes, I do. What? <laughs> I definitely do use AI at work. How? How do you use AI at work? Oh, a number of stuff. Sometimes like I want to write some nuanced thing I want to do. So for example, how do I do a distinct in Spark when there are column collisions or some weird stuff? I am not going to keep that stuff in my head. Mm -hmm. I will just have AI tell me the code because like it's faster than like um, doing a search and finding Stack Overflow articles. Yeah. So in, in some way you kind of use AI to replace Stack Overflow on how to do certain things. Yeah. Okay. My For me, I, I definitely use it. Um, but I use it to explain code because I see the code, but sometimes, so I work in a very heavy C sharp. Well, I used to work in a very heavy C sharp thing and they use um, deep, deep object oriented design. When I say deep, I mean interfaces everywhere. So, yeah. you know, there's like dependency injection from this place. Some stuff are very .NET dependent and I'm like, yo, I have like, this thing looks very, very complicated, right? And I just copy a whole class. And then I ask, okay, how how does, like, what's the relationship between these things? And then it just tells me. And then sometimes it has nuances to say, based on how this code is written, the thing that you're looking for is not inside here, yeah. right? It's coming in through this injected dependency or stuff like that. And it's kind of like stuff where I would sometimes maybe ask, I would have otherwise asked a senior engineer, but I'm like, all right, I just paste it here and then it tells me and then I can then go or just go to them with more direct question to say, okay, I know this thing is not here. Where is it? So that's how I use it. I also use it to kind of explain certain concepts like um, I think it was anonymous functions or like directives in C Sharp. And I was like, I have, it looks familiar, but I don't know what is happening. And then I'll paste it and be like, all right, what is this thing? And I'll be like, oh, it looks like it's a, and I'm like, ah, and then, you know, that's basically how I use it. Yeah. Oh, oh, so um, I think on that note, I also use AI for other things as well. So mm -hmm. um, I sometimes use it to help me think about design patterns. Mm -hmm. um, and also because I'm, I'm a data engineer, so I write Java, Python, and Scala. So I might think about how do I, I know how to do something maybe in Python. I'm like, what is the Scala equivalent of this mm -hmm. exact thing? So I can write it in Python mm -hmm. and then say, hey, what's the Scala equivalent of this? Or like, for example, I'm looking at, I'm thinking about, hmm, I want to write software and I'm trying to figure out what design pattern to use. So I can sometimes have AI say, hey, like, um, I was going to use a orchestrator pattern, but what might be alternatives and like, why might that be good versus bad? And like, have it critique some alternatives so I know, like, so I can have like a decent conversation about what pattern to use. Yeah, that, that I think that that makes sense. I've also used it to kind of generate unit tests in certain scenarios where I've been like, hey, that's for my own personal work, right? I'm like, hey, um, this is the class, right? And to that sense, I actually want us to dive into um, a specific thing that happened. So I was working on this Flutter project, right? It's for an app that I built called the Optil app. And the app basically just helps you keep track of upcoming events that you have coming up. That's all the app does. And every year or every couple of years, I try to update the app, right? <laughs> as much as I can. And I was trying to update it this year and... I was like, all right, one thing, you know, the code is growing. I wanted to add iOS widgets to the app. The code is growing. Let me try, let me add unit tests. When I started this app, it was in 2020. I was fresh out of college. I didn't know what unit tests was. With years of experience now, I'm like, all right, let me add some sort of testing. And I hadn't written tests to test widgets. So I was like, man, this thing is new to me. I went, I read the documentation. I was like, oh, yeah, you know, it looks simple. The documentation always looks simple. Right, they always show you the most rudimentary, the most simple, the most breakdown. Like, all right, you have A and you have B. C comes next. You're like, ah, no shit. Easy. But in your actual work, it's like you have to go write some poetry. You know, just some very very complicated stuff. So, 
when I then went to go write the test for my own, you know, code, it was like, man, this thing was, it would have taken me days or if not weeks. And I was like, man, I didn't have time to do this. Then I heard of Koso AI, the thing. And I was like, oh yeah, I can simply just use Koso AI. Absolutely. So I downloaded it and I asked it. I was like, hey, write unit test for the login.dart file. And it was like, oh, sure. And it just generated like seven, eight tests. And I was like, yo. And I was going through the test. And it actually made sense. Everything he was testing for, he was doing a lot of stuff. I was like, yo, 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 yo. This is great. Nice. You know, I, I really don't, whoa, okay. You know what I mean? I was like, this is amazing. Yeah. And I ran the test. They all failed. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. They all failed. Yep. And I was like, oh, okay. The test in theory looked great, what they're testing for. But all of the tests failed. And I went to go try to figure out why the tests were failing. And I could not for the life. I felt hopeless. I felt aimless. Because that wasn't my code. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Like, you bring up a very important point, And that is the real problem. One of my big problems with, with using AI a lot at, to, to code is coding is actually a process where you build a mental model in your head. And then you interact with that mental model by your type to get it to do something. When you start to pull things from somewhere that you don't have a mental model of, you don't know how things fit any longer, right? Mm. And I think that that comes into play when you try to say, hey, I want to debug this thing. Well, if you don't understand how it works or you're using, like, yeah, like you get suggestions to use like patterns or libraries or tools that you have no familiarity with, it might actually work. Like, I think it's even worse when it works, but it might actually work, <laughs> but literally your mental model has started to diverge from what your code base looks like. Mm. So you cannot reason about your code. And I think that is the most important thing that a software engineer is able to do. Like reason about your code in a way that is faithful to what your code and your compiler and your build environment and the deployed environment are going to do. Mm. And if you cannot match, if there's a, there's a mismatch between those two things, you start to get into problems where, oh, your manager says, oh, like just change this one small tiny thing. But you don't know where... Or how exactly or in this like you know what you meant to do, but as you said, I think you bring up a very, very important point because that that's exactly what was happening with, with me in that scenario where I couldn't I didn't feel confident enough <clears throat> to, to make that change because it, it wasn't my code, yeah. right? It was in my project, but it wasn't my code. And I'm like, and they say, Oh, you know, there's a there's an error in this line. I'm like, what is this line even doing? Yeah. Right? I have no idea why this line is there or what this line is doing, and then you know, if you've written unit tests, you know, you have to kind of like, there's there's three steps, triple A, um, arrange, assert, test, or something like that. But first you have to do some specific a arrangements, right? You yeah. create a few mock objects or you do anything. Then you call the actual function. Then you test the, you know, this thing. Then you, then, no, arrange, act, assert. Yeah. yeah right. You arrange the test, then you act, right? You call the function and then you assert whether the outcome is true or false. Yeah. But I, I, I didn't understand anything that was happening in the range because I didn't arrange anything, right? Acts, it was clear. I knew what it was trying to test. It was trying to test whether when it pressed a button, it would go to the next page. Yeah. And then the assert came back and it was false. Yeah. But then I didn't understand any, any of the range. And it took me like, it, it took me, like I had to step away from it, then yeah. come back to it because yeah. I was like, man, I was overwhelmed. Right? I had seven of them that were failing and it was a lot of code to like debug. And then when I came back from it, I didn't, I realized this thing was arranging things it didn't need to arrange. Yep. 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 Right. It was, it was adding extra layer of complication that wasn't needed. Some of them, were, which was, some of them was making the code to fail, but most of them were just like, yeah, I can see why you would want to arrange this, but arranging this wouldn't change the outcome of this test. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So it's like, that's when it then hit me. Yeah. This thing is great, but it also adds an extra layer of, jargons it's more code it's more lines of code more things that need to go through right and that's just for test if it act, if it does actual implementation it'll be a whole different thing because yeah. it'll then add code in a way where you're like yeah if you don't understand it you're cooked yeah. literally yeah um and another another part of what the problem with using ai is is that um in reality what you should always remember is that no matter what model you're using there is a concept of a context window there mm. is only so much that the model can get fed. And also depends on how you use the model, right? Because if you're using chat GPT and you're copying and pasting lines of code, 
it doesn't get the full context of the project you're working on, right? It gets the context of just what you've given it. Mm -hmm. So it's very possible and very easy that you will start to diverge from the way other things have been done in the project because you are working on one small subset of features, for example, mm -hmm. and then you use chat GPT a lot and then you just make your own patterns mm -hmm. and every other part of the repo and every other part of the project uses a different pattern. Mm. But because for example, you, the, the, um, the model or the AI doesn't get all of all the other context. I think so always might be solved by using something like Cursor, for example, that gets rid of your repo. But if that doesn't happen, then you get to a spot where like you just are doing your own weird thing and you're logging weirdly or you're just following different patterns from every other feature that you have untouched because there is no cross talk about how that part is evolving from how this part is evolving, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's a, that's a thing as well with using AI. Yeah, I, I think when when we get to, you know, we're at the place now where was it Mac, Mac Zuckerberg was like, you know, there'll be mid-level software engineers. There'll be AI doing work, work of mid-level software engineers. Um the CEO of sales, was it Salesforce? Or one company was like, yeah, we're not going to hire anymore. Like, last year, we, we, they were like a net zero for new software engineers. Klarna, I think. Yeah. Kla yeah. Well, was it Klarna? Well, some weird comp some one of these companies anyway. Yeah, I, I think it was Salesforce. And then there was one other company that was like, what did they say? Um, you know, there are all this, you know, talks about, hey, you know, AI is going to replace software engineers. AI is coming for this. There's the Devon, this thing that, that came out. And it's like, I see those and I think in theory for simple stuff, right? For very, very rudimentary stuff. I see maybe you want to spin up a simple web server that just maybe gets data and then sends it to an S3 bucket. Yeah. Simple. Yeah. The second, it starts to get more complicated. The second, it starts to have nuances where it's like, okay, in theory, this should work. But anybody with common sense would realize that, okay, this needs to be done a completely different way because in the future... We have to account for this yeah. because we know the AI doesn't know the future, yeah. right? The AI doesn't have experience. Yeah. All the AI does is just, it knows patterns of code that it has seen before. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with AI doing all your code, I think you get to a point where your PM has an idea for a project, doesn't have understanding of feasibility, and then just request that hey, AI build this. And then you get a 200,000 line project automatically built. But building the software is not all that a software engineer does. It mm. actually is like maintaining the software, dealing with updates, all of all that stuff. So like there's that 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 mismatch between like, oh, you can generate a lot of code, but then you actually have to maintain that code and you're legally on the hook for things the code does. But how does that get solved? So like I like the idea of like AI is going to take away the jobs. I think AI will reduce the number of people required to do certain tasks, lots of tasks. Mm -hmm. And like, it will massively improve productivity. But I also don't think that um, that's going to be the end of the world. And also, to be honest, like if, um, so imagine two companies, Facebook and, and um, TikTok. Mm -hmm. If Facebook can write the code in one third the time, TikTok can also write the code in one third the time. Mm -hmm. So the their competition just gets more intense because mm -hmm. then you're like, oh, I can do this while you can, we can start to do that stuff in two weeks. And mm -hmm. then, both companies just compete more intensely and mm. they just need more new features. Yeah. So the feature rollout cadence just in, so if, for example, your VP might have pushed 12 projects every year. Now it can make the 24 or 36. So things that would have been below the cut line mm -hmm. three years ago will now make the cut line, mm -hmm. but there's going to be more stuff. And like the more things you ship, the more bugs you ship, the more problems you ship. I I, th I think that's, 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 that's something that, people don't even talk about enough. It's majority of the time, you're, you're, you're not writing new code. Yes. <laughs> you're reading code that other people have written yep. and trying to modify it or yep. trying to change it in some way, right? Yep. And maybe I'm wrong, but I can't imagine AI doing it as well and understanding the nuances in certain aspects, right? Because I can't, let me, listen, every time I've faced a challenging problem at work that has to do with, okay, man, this thing is so, so, so hard. The one time that I've been like, all right, let me just carry everything and give AI. It sucked at it. Yes. And this isn't, you know, small models, right? Like, I think it was four at the time. It sucked. Yeah. Right? Like, all, or I'm like, all right, let me try to give it as much context as possible, help me with this thing. It didn't help. Yeah. Like, it was giving me things that wasn't, I'm like, this won't work, right? Yeah. But to it, it has to give me something. So it just spits out whatever, right? 
So ultimately, I think, yeah, the, with more code and with more stuff happening, um, we need to use AI to kind of like be more productive. But ultimately, right, I really, really like to, I really loved what you said there where it's like coding is not just about writing the code, right? There's a mental model that you're building as you're, as, as you're interacting. And the more you use AI and you're not understanding it, the more you're, you're, you are divergent from it. Yeah. And like, honestly, if you're a decently junior engineer, at some point, AI is going to suggest code that your principals don't understand. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and it will destroy your MR. Yeah. Just heads up. Like, yeah. If you are doing super complicated stuff in code that also that is beyond your principal's ability to easily understand, you're going to get feedback to say, hey, like... Um, Make this more simple, yeah. And also, like, this is not junior engineer code. <laughs> um, like, yeah. you're using, like, patterns. Like, obviously, you probably be, you might be, like, ridiculously smart. Mm -hmm. But, like, if you're writing code that is super nuanced and, like, very hard to debug, as somebody that mentors engineers at work... When I see stuff that was clearly written by AI and the person is asking me to spend my time like decomposing and understanding that and it clearly is like not what I expect from the person's mental model of the work, I am more wary when I review that MR because I'm like, hey, if this person, I don't think the person completely understands what code they are writing. So mm -hmm. then I am very wary and then I go, if it happens a few times, I'm like, hey, like, did you use ChatGPT to, to write this code? Like, did you write this code yourself? And not because, like, I don't think the person is smart, but I think, like, there is a lot more, not their code that is showing up mm -hmm. there. And I've seen their code a decent amount of times that I kind of know, like, what energy I'm going to bring to an to a, to a, um, MR review. So, yeah, I think ultimately you need to understand what you're copying. Yeah. Right? Don't just, like, how do I put it? Chat GPT and AI isn't the easy way out. Yeah. It's more, I think, to be honest, I just see it as an over, like a, like stack overflow on steroids, yeah. right? Where you're not having to read through and weave through several posts to like upvote things or to like downvote things. Yeah. Also, um, let to to because we're about to wrap up. Mm -hmm. Do you have quest? Do you have like tips on how to use AI well at work? The one way that I would say is the way that I found works for me is, and this not just me specifically or. Um, related to work, give as much context as possible. Fair. Context, right? Context, content. Like, we are so used to prompts being one line, right? Bro, a prompt's gonna be three pages, right? The more you do that, then the better it gets at giving you exactly what you want. Yeah. Right. What about I have, you? I have different opinions. I mm -hmm. think when you tell AI to generate code for you, ask it to explain itself. Mm -hmm. Very, very, very verbose. Mm -hmm. To be honest, like, I would explain itself. And then ask it, hey, are there simpler alternatives? And mm -hmm. always be asking, are there simpler alternatives? And if you have a few code samples, say, hey, can you write in my code style? Mm -hmm. But like, try to get it to simplify and make sure that it explains every single line mm -hmm. before you copy paste it. Like, make sure you understand every single line of what it is doing. Make sure you understand if it's pulling in a new dependency, ask why can mm -hmm. you do this simpler? But don't just ever copy and paste the code that AI gives you. Yeah, like, interrogate agree. it very, very well yeah. to be sure that you want to put that code in your code base. I think that's a big one. That's a big plus on the ask why because it's giving you the code. Might as well ask it what its reasoning is, right? If anything, have it give you the code line by line, yeah. right? All right, and explain each one, right? Ex like, kind of break it down into steps. That way, even you can go put comments in there so you have a better understanding, right? Ultimately, these AI models, these AI tools, they're there to make life better. They're there to make life easier, you just have to use them properly yeah. and understand what they're giving you. Otherwise, you just become dumber, for lack of a better way of putting it, right? You're putting out a lot, but not actually understanding what you're actually doing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, so I think that's it. Um, we're at time, but that was good. Yeah. Um, use AI, use AI carefully at work um, and stay safe, y'all. Thank you so much for tuning in. We will catch you on the next one. Until then, stay safe.